Aloha, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining us today to be able to worship God. I hope you're well. Last Sunday, we were treated to hear from Dave Pikert preaching about having faith in the storms. And I am grateful for him sharing his life in the storms that he and Sarah have gone through this past year. It has not been easy for them. In only a God way, and I told Dave this, but uh, their faithfulness spurred on my faithfulness to stay focused on Jesus. Even if Jesus is still sleeping in the boat, he's got everything under control. Uh, Dave, if you're watching, thanks for encouraging the church. Grateful you guys are taking some time here in Hawaii, uh, your home away from home. Okay, I wanna just take a, a few moments here to stop and pause and pray. So I'm gonna leave a few moments of silence and I want to encourage each one of you to just think of one word that will help prepare you for worship. So let's bow and have a word of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, whatever word that each one of us is thinking about, we ask that you embrace it, accept it, and help us to draw to a closer intimate relationship with you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to learn from your word, to lift up our hearts and our minds, and just the help that we need to prepare ourselves to honor you. Thank you for directing us and guiding us through your holy scriptures. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm not sure what word you thought about. I, I thought about just the word, the cross, and that helped me to quickly just engage and be in the right posture to be able to worship God. On a sobering note, close to 4.5 million people have died from COVID worldwide. About 670,000 of those within the United States. In addition to the deaths, close to 225 million people have contracted the virus. But that's not all. Because of what's happened, there's economic fallout from the virus. Some experts estimate that as many as 40% of small businesses have closed permanently during the pandemic. Unemployment rates have skyrocketed over this last year. People have lost their life's work in the span of just a few weeks. There's also been psychological consequences. Mental health is a great concern these days. Suicide rates are rising. So are the rates of people suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. Domestic violence, cases have soared to new heights as families have been forced to spend extended time together with no outlet for the pressures of being confined for a long period of time. It is it has been truly a dark time for our world and a challenging time for the church, no question about it. Brothers and sisters, I share these things because I want us to stay sensitized. I want, I want to stay sensitized because the world is truly hurting. And this is absolutely a storm for our world and it's difficult to know when things are gonna let up. Now, you may be going through your own personal storms. What I do know is that as people of faith, we don't have to settle for bad news. We have a secret weapon that keeps us encouraged. Our hope comes from God, and he's the answer to help us through any storm. So where do we go from here? That's a question I asked myself and for the church. Two weeks ago, we talked about learning from the first century church and what they did that could help us today. We learned to be worshipful by incorporating more silence and stillness in our times with God, making sure we're setting aside a few times a day to be silent and recenter our lives back on Him. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It's so important for us to stop 
and still our hearts and our minds during the day. Just to be able to be silent with God can bring a lot of strength and direction to our lives. So how have you done this past week? Did you incorporate more times of stillness and silence in your time with God? And brothers and sisters, it's not a legalistic thing that I want to encourage you to do, but it's an exercise that's gonna help you and me stay grounded on God. Now, I will say, if you don't have these good habits of stopping and being still and silent into your daily life, it's gonna take effort. It's gonna take practice to create these new rhythms. Keep persevering. You'll see the benefits if you don't give up. Okay, let's review the anchor passage that we learned from two weeks ago. But I wanna read it from a different version so that we don't get so familiar with it. But we talked about Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. And here we read it in the message version. And it talks about the church. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe, all those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day, their number grew as God added those who were saved. So not only was the early church worshipful, they were praising God, but they were also committed to doing life together. They were relational. This is what kept them encouraged and strong spiritually. There were real needs at the time in Jerusalem. Thousands of people, if you remember, gathered together for the annual holidays. And because of the miraculous event at the day of Pentecost, their lives were changed. Instead of going back to their hometown or their home nation, they stayed in Jerusalem and enjoyed their new fellowship with the other disciples. Someone had to take care of all these new people in town. So the new church sacrificed, they pooled their resources and looked to meet each other's needs. This is the church in action. So where did they learn this from? Well, certainly there were cultural influences that help them to be this way. But I believe, more importantly, they learned it from Jesus Christ. Let me remind us of how Jesus modeled this for the apostles, who then in turn modeled it for the early church. For example, foot washing was common in the Bible. People traveled mostly on foot, in sandals, in slippers across the dusty roads of Judea. When entering a home, it was customary to wash one's feet and it was rude to not offer this to your guests. Now, washing feet was a job for a household servant to carry out when the guests arrived. You can read one reference in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 41. This job was a subservient task. Well, Jesus did this for his disciple in John chapter 13. Even though he was the master, he took the lowliest position of a servant, a slave, and did this for them. He washed their feet. And this is what he said to them afterwards in John 13, verse 15 through 17. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus' act of washing the disciples' feet demonstrated love in action. Even though Jesus was their rabbi and Lord, 
He assumed a position of humility and service because he loved those he served. Jesus commanded his disciples to wash each other's feet, to serve one another in love according to the example he set. Now, Son and I did this for a group of disciples many years ago. And honestly, it was very humbling for everyone. For us to be able to bring a, a wash basin and a towel and to be able to wash our brothers and sisters' feet in a, in a circle. It was very humbling. But it taught all of us, it taught me particularly, the type of heart that God wants from me, from us, as we relate to other people. Now, these disciples would soon be sent out as the messengers of the Christian church. It started with the apostles. They would be leaders in many places. Indeed, James, John, and Peter became leaders of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Jesus taught them that as they labored to spread the gospel, they first and foremost had to be servants to those whom they taught. Fortunately for us, they took Jesus' lesson to heart, and we're recipients of how awesome church is today. Now, in another example, Jesus taught the disciples of who was the greatest in the kingdom. This is what he said in Mark chapter 10, verse 43 through 45. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The pathway to greatness in God's eyes would be, would be to become a servant of all. And Jesus demonstrated this with his own life. He didn't come to earth to be served by us, but he came to serve us. And he gave up his life as a ransom so we, would, we could be set free from the eternal consequences of sin. Wow, let's, let's not forget what Christ has done for each one of us. This is, the, this is the spirit and attitude in which the disciples brought into the fellowship. They were taught to serve one another, and their greatest model was Jesus Christ. And this is something that we can do and keep on doing as a church, figuring out ways to serve each other in the fellowship, especially while we're in a pandemic. Now, I will say, we, we have a lot of great, incredible brothers and sisters in the Oahu Church who are devoted to the fellowship. I am so grateful for our church family. We have many who, are, who serve and give time and money and food and open up their homes for others to stay in. Thank you for being great representations of Jesus. Let's continue to be this way and do these things all the more. As I mentioned last time, you know, we've had a greater number of deaths connected with the disciples in the church, or even disciples themselves. And many families are grieving because it's a major adjustment right now, not having loved ones around anymore. Thank you to the many families who have stepped up to provide meals to these grieving families. I appreciate you going the extra mile to serve and meet some needs. A family I wanna be able to lift up is Mike and Gwen Jones along with their three boys. Over the past several years, they've gone the extra mile serving and loving a brother named Greg Ventayan. When Greg was baptized back in 2018, he had several health issues that eventually led him to be legally blind. His hospital visits were frequent because of his health challenges, most especially him dealing with heart complications. The Jones family consistently picked him up and brought him back to his home just about every time that we had in-person fellowship, just so that Greg could be encouraged. Now, no one told the Jones family to do this. They just did it and took it upon themselves and the responsibility to serve Greg. Now, sadly, Greg recently passed away. God took him home, and he's certainly in a better place. And at the same time, I'm thankful 
the Jones Ohana served him in his last days. Thank you, Mike and Gwen and the boys. Another person that I wanted to mention was my wife's son. And I really appreciate her because uh, honestly, she's such a great example to me of someone who serves. She's always cooking for other people, looking for ways to encourage others in the church. She's incredibly thoughtful. And we just celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. And I couldn't be more grateful for her. She absolutely makes me a better person, a better man, a better husband, because she helps me to do things that I wouldn't do naturally left to myself. I love you, honey, if you're watching. I hope you're watching. I wanna mention one of the kids in our church in connection with this and my wife. And uh, this child is, her name is Adele Rue, daughter of voter and Sarah Rue. And Adele is five years old, she's in kindergarten. But last week she mailed a hand-drawn card to Son to encourage her, knowing that Son's eldest brother passed away recently. Uh, here's a picture of the card and that's Adele's drawing. Isn't that adorable? Now, that's Son on the front. Can you see the resemblance? I can. We can. Adele, if you're watching, thank you for the card for Auntie Son. She was so encouraged by it. And Adele, we have it on our refrigerator. Cards on the refrigerator really mean something and yours made it. Thank you. You see, we don't, we don't always have to be together in person to serve one another. We could send a card, we could send an encouraging text, or even drop off a meal, like many of you have been doing. That's meeting needs and serving one another. Amen. How else can we be devoted to the fellowship and be relational? We can connect with our Hana group. You know, right now, we may not be able to meet as a larger congregation, but I am so thankful that we can keep meeting in smaller groups. I'm very grateful for the group leaders who continue to serve over the past several years, especially during a time like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm thankful for the many groups that are meeting all over the island. Grateful that you're taking care of each other. You know, in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Honestly, it takes more considering and more creativity to figure out how to spur each other on in our current paradigm. We're doing church differently. We all know this. But if we live by God's principles, we'll be just fine. Now, moving forward, here's what I hope for. This is what I hope for, that everyone in the fellowship gets connected to a group of disciples, spurring each other on, encouraging one another, and going to God. Now, many of you are doing this and that's great, awesome. I want to encourage all the rest who are not connected. Please seek out a group, get connected, build those relationships. They're gonna help you stay faithful in the long run. We live in a time that's it's easier to slip through the cracks and be more independent and less committed to the body. It's up to you to make sure that doesn't happen. If you're having trouble getting connected to a group, we're more than happy to help. I just know we all need support and encouragement at this time. You can, you can talk to a group leader directly, or you can go to the website, click on the Ohana Groups page and find a group to connect with. Devotion to the fellowship 
is modeled in the New Testament church. And let's find a way to imitate it today. Amen. Amen. Okay, the last thing that we can do to serve and be relational is to serve the community. Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11, a day that will be forever etched in U.S. history and really in the world. The way we do life has been forever changed. To commemorate this day, historically, our church would honor first responders, particularly the firefighters on the island by providing gift baskets with all kinds of goodies. We did this to say thank you. And we did this for just about every fire station on Oahu. This year, we wanted to do something a little bit different because of the circumstances. Because of all the COVID cases on the island, we wanted to encourage and express thanks to the medical staff, the doctors and the nurses who are taking care of all the COVID patients at Queens Medical Center, at both the Punch Bowl and the Wastawahu locations. Most, if not all, COVID cases on the island are at these hospitals. And we thought this would be, this would be a way that as a church, we could encourage the staff who are fatigued and worn out with no end in sight. The Hope Committee has already made connections with Queens and has come up with a plan for these locations. So here's what we're asking the church to do. We're asking the Ohana groups to work together to provide food items and or donations to help provide bentos or other grab and go items to encourage these frontline workers. Thank you, Carol Gira and LNL. They're gonna help us put these bentos together with our financial contributions. Uh, sometimes the medical staff has little time to eat so they need something quick and accessible. And I'm so thankful that we can find ways to serve the people in our community who help us to be safe. Now, an email with instructions was sent out to the church this past week. Groups can even make financial donations through our Tidely app under the First Responders Hope Project. So you can even go there and make a contribution towards this project. We're planning to give these gifts by September 25th. So Ohana groups, let's work together for that goal, uh, please invite others, family members, friends, coworkers who may wanna to contribute to this project. Let's pray and prepare for this encouraging expression of thanks to these noble and heroic frontline workers. I wanna end by reading a short quote that I read recently that helped me to put things into perspective. You see, leading a church virtually has its challenges. Many things have changed, but the needs of the church and community remain and have grown. I was encouraged reading something about Mother Teresa. In 1952, Mother Teresa began picking up the dying in the streets of Calcutta, India. By 1980, she and over 3,000 members of her order, the Missionaries of Charity, were working in 52 countries. Her teachings and life give us profound insight into what it means to follow Jesus in our world today. And I wanna read a quote from her. And she simply says, I never look at the masses as my responsibility. I look only at the individual. I can love only one person at a time. I can feed only one person at a time, just one, one, one. You get closer to Christ by coming closer to each other. As Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do it to me. So you begin. I begin. I picked up one person. The whole work is only a drop in the ocean. But if we don't put the drop in, the ocean would be one drop less. Same thing for you. Same thing in your family. Same thing in the church where you go, just begin. One, one, one. At the end of our lives, we'll not be judged by how many diplomas we've received, how much money we have made, or how many great things we've done. 
we will be judged by I was hungry and he gave me to eat. I was naked and he clothed me. I was homeless and you took me in. Now, Mother Teresa is quoting from what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25. Wow, what incredible thoughts. Just love one person at a time. Don't be overwhelmed with the numbers of people or the numbers of needs. Just love one person at a time. We can all do this. I can do this. You can do this. We can all love one person at a time. We can fight hard to be like Jesus to one person at a time. So who can you love this week? One person at a time. That's great advice for you and for me. Brothers and sisters, let's look to serve others just like Jesus. Connect with an Ohana group this week and let's do a great job encouraging the staff at Queens Medical Center. God bless. Before you go, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can also follow us on social media and find the link to our connection card down in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye.